let me put on my good Canadian hat. Yeah, we're going to act on what the government tells. Oh, come on. No. I mean, so look at your southern neighbor. Your southern, and your southern neighbor, the private sector, is not, act, not waiting and acting on what federal or state level legislatures are doing. What it's doing is it's influencing, it's shaping it, it's driving it. And dictating might be going too far, although with, with <laughs> the uh, current incumbent, maybe it is. But it, it's a much more uh, uh, interactive, uh, relational, ambitious uh, agenda than sometimes we've seen. And I'm not just talking about Canada, because it's, it's, it's a problem I recognize in my own country as well. How do we drive these, the, 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 the aspirations of innovation into policy? The private sector have to, be, have to take much more of a role in helping articulate, drive, and, and, and shape that policy. And it has to be uh, uh, much more of, of an interaction between public and, and private sector. Should the public sector be responding? Well, of course the public sector should be responding. Well, the public sector's role at the end of the day on innovation is to, is to enable a space whereby taxpayers' money can be invested in an optimal way to drive productivity gains, to drive uh, the, growth, the growth of our economies, and do it in a way which is focused on the, the needs, requirements, and demands of, of, of Canada's population. So public sector response has to be to enable that to, uh, to, to create the framework conditions that don't get in the way of innovators, but at the same time to create the checks and balances to ensure that the Canadian uh, voting population is getting what they want. So it's a shaping and it's a responding. Similarly, the private sector, the private sector wants to flourish here in Canada, then well, you know, we have a French, a French one amongst us. I go back to Rousseau's social contract. We need a, we need a modern Rousseau-esque social <laughs> contract. And I think if, if any country in the world still sees that as something which is uh, within the ambit of, of the, 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 the thinking of, of their population, then if it's not Canada, I don't know where it is. Oh, in Canada, we've started to speak of clean technology as a sector. Mm -hmm. and, and in some ways, I agree with that characterization because it gives it legitimacy and allows us to ask for government to collect data for it and all these kinds of things. But in other ways, I completely disagree with that because what we see at SDTC is that clean technology is an enabler of all sectors and it's an enabler of cross-pollinization of ideas. And it, so in that way, it's, I think, the same as digital. It's the same as artificial intelligence. It's the same as a number of things that, in fact, are evolutionizing or revolutionizing, depend on, on which broader goods producing sector you're talking about, um, the way that we're thinking about things. So, you know, earlier we talked about Uber and, tra and transportation. Like, Uber has nothing to do in bases with transportation sector as a goods producing sector. However, the way society and is integrating that into the transportation sector is changing how we all think about transportation in total. Um, electricity, in some ways, is, is, is a little bit doing the same things, but it's a little bit harder, I think, for, trans for electri electricity because the capital stock and base infrastructure that's in electricity that's been built up in Canada over 100 years and other nations much longer, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're really just trying to change the, at the marginal additions related to electricity, and it's going to take a long time to rapidly transform the broader infrastructure that is, that is currently in place. I think in some ways, um, you know, you're seeing that in mining, you're seeing that in, uh, in uh, fossil fuel usage as well. And, and, so, and so what we see at SDTC is in the sectors that are goods producing, not the clean tech sector per se, but in the sectors that are good producing, we see a lot of stuff that's about improving efficiency within those sectors. And I think that in some ways that's really important because we have this big capital stock that's pre-existing that you want to try and get to the best kinds of efficiencies that you can. But there's a limit there. We need the evolutionary change that's perhaps merely sectoral focus and traditional goods producing sectoral focus because we still do have this big capital stock of stuff that provides goods and services to society that we need, energy, clean water, all these things. But that at the same time we know that we want to one day soon, hopefully, make them in a completely different way and that we want to have some orderly transition of how we, you know, move through those things, both from a financial capital perspective and a human capital perspective and all these other things. And so how do we start to enable that over time? So, so I look at the European um, 
experience here. And, you know, the, the great new idea in the last few years has been the idea of smart specialization. And I remember when smart specialization first came up uh, around the OECD, around table load, and, the, um, and I think of the, th the 30, whatever it was, probably four or five delegations at the table at the time. Smart specialization, if you'd taken each of them out room and said, what does it mean to you? You'd probably have got, if it was 35, 36 different uh, uh, views. Um, and, and I'm not sure that's changed very much. I mean, the, the, the basic notion of smart specialization is work out where your, uh, your intellectual assets lie, look at uh, where uh, you've got sectoral strengths, existing uh, business strengths in your ecosystem, uh, good science innovation uh, perspective to drive it, and where there's a potential market opportunity and focus on that. And that smacks of old-fashioned industrial policy, which, by the way, as you've probably noticed, uh, the UK is about to, to embrace again. Does that stand the test of time? Well, it never has so far. It never has so far. Whenever we've seen any country that's gone down a very, very focused sector-specific industrial policy, it's worked on a couple of sectors for a while, and then it's, and then it's, it's rapidly gone wrong. I mean, it's essentially the build, they're building in obsolescence into uh, policy. So sector-based policies, from the benefit of hindsight, evidentially work a little bit, but then stop working. Uh, so. Surely the only way to approach things is to take uh, a broader port, uh, policy portfolio perspective and look at some things which are market-driven opportunities today, look at building some enabling competencies that allow you to service these market-based opportunities today, tomorrow, and in the future, and have a policy uh, environment which remains open and receptive to disruptive technologies.